Uh, welcome to, this, uh, to the 29 lecture series uh, sponsored by the Scandinavian Heritage Foundation and the Portland State University um, Language Department. Tonight we have two speakers, both storytellers, Barbara Frankhauser and Ken Iverson. Before they get up to the podium, I would like to tell you a little bit about them. I will introduce them both at once. Barbara Frankhauser is born in, was born in Wisconsin and is totally Norwegian all over the place. <laughs> uh, she graduated from San Francisco State University with a degree in English, literature with a, with a, uh, emphasis on, um, on, with a writing emphasis. Uh, from there she went on to advertising. But she had enough of that and she became a ski bum. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, uh, and then she got a little bit tired of that, and she opened up a restaurant in Colorado. And then she was tired of living hamburgers. <laughs> and then she went back to Chicago uh, and uh, started with advertising again. And uh, uh, she remained there for nine years. And when she left the company in 1981, she became the she was already the vice president. Then it was all to Portland, Oregon. Barbara became creative director of a small ad agency. Then in 1989, she uh, started her own freelance business, and years later, she went on to bigger and better things before she retired in 2007. <coughs> Barbara is the current president of the Portland Storytellers Guild, and for the last two years, she has been writing and telling her stories. That is the first speaker. Here's speaker number two right here. <laughs> his name is Ken Iverson, and he has spent most of his life telling stories. His philosophy and belief is that stories bring people together. Uh, he tells original stories uh, as well as traditional and contemporary folk tales and myth from around the world uh, to audience of all ages, and you are right in the right spot for this. <laughs> Kenny is a founding member and past president of the Portland Story Tellers Guild. Uh, he also offers workshop in creative writing if you would like to do, uh, do something like that. He has been featured uh, teller at the Story by the Sea, a storytelling festival in Newport, and has done similar presentation in several other places. In 2014, Ken received the Oracle Award for the Pacific region, which is all the Pacific states. So that was quite an honor. And he's actually going to be the first speaker. So welcome, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried to schedule them for anything. It's horrendous. They won't be in the program after all, so just wanted you to know why. But tonight we are doing something that the ancient Nordic people did. Gathering together to hear a story. But those early settlers in the Nordic lands, Oh, they had to be bold, they had to be brave and adventuresome I people, I and I personally think it a little bit crazy. How could you move to a land? How could you settle in a land that was so wild, so beautiful, yes, but so wild and often unforgiving? Oh, the land, beautiful lakes, fjords, vast plains leading to sheer cliffs that overlooked the crashing waves of the frigid North Pacific and Arctic Oceans. There were mountainous regions taught by areas that were covered by snow and ice in the winter, and some areas were covered by snow and ice year around. And then there were the volcanoes. Can't forget those. At any moment, at any moment, the earth could open, it could roar, it could spit fire, and it could swallow you. Or it could shake and unleash an avalanche of snow that could smother your homestead in an instant. 
it's easy to see where the early Nordic people may have felt that indeed the land and the sea themselves were alive. Now the ancient people, they had myths. Oh, the myths are the stories that come to us that tell us about gods and goddesses and other divine beings. And there was a time when these myths were completely received as true and sacred. The primary purpose of the myth, it was to help us understand life's mysteries. It would also help us to capture, capture the memories of a culture's glorious past and help us to understand their values, their customs, and even their religious rituals and how they had come to be. Many of the early Nordic people believed there was nothing more wonderful or honorable than to die fearlessly in battle, fighting against the evils of the world. They honored people who could face life's challenges, not with bitterness, but with a sense of humor, with a spirit of adventure. A lot of times when you hear of the myths, it's easy to think that they were written for an ancient time. But if you study the myths, very soon you will see that their time is broad. Their wisdom is ageless. They were written for us. Now tonight, we're gathering just as long ago. The old and the young would gather around their smoky fires in their long halls, especially if a traveling poet or storyteller had come to the village. So tonight we continue the tradition of a village gathering to hear a story, to share an adventure. Thor was bored, very, very bored. <laughs> it had been a long time since he had a reason to pull Molnir, his great powerful hammer, out of his belt and test his strength against anyone. And as he sat around Asgard, contemplating what to do about it, it occurred to him, this might be the perfect time to go to Jutenheim, the land of the frost giants. There was a king there, Utgard Loki, that he might <coughs> challenge to a, a little challenge of skill, strength, art, perhaps. And as he thought about it, the perfect traveling plant companion that he could think of was Loki. And one of the reasons was, Loki had only recently had the stitches taken out of his mouth. Now, he'd had his mouth stitched up because he had had a, a bad run-in with a dwarf, and he had lost the competition, and that was the punishment. And having his mouth stitched up proved kind of a blessing because he stopped being quite so mischievous. And once the stitches were out, and he was trying to make sure they didn't come back in. And so he'd been on his best behavior. And Thor knew that Loki would be a good traveling companion, as evil he was, as he was, but he knew good stories. And so he invited Loki to join him. And Loki, when he heard where he was planning, where Thor was planning on going, said, it's probably a good thing that you've invited me, because brains always overcome brawn. And frankly, Thor, <laughs> Your bright brains are about as, as bright as, as dull as your hammer. <laughs> well, Thor ignored this insult, and they made plans to leave in the morning. So, come dawn, Thor went to the stables, and he got his two goats, Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder, and he brought them out and hitched them up to his chariot, and Thor and Loki got in the chariot and took off across Asgard under the great blue dome. And the gods and goddesses gathered to wish them well and have a safe journey. And off they went across Asgard, past Hemdal, guardian of the Rainbow Bridge, over the Rainbow Bridge, down into Midgard, land of the humans, and off to the north, to Jutenheim, the land of the frost giants. Well, they traveled all day, telling each other jokes and stories and gossiping about the other gods and goddesses, as travelers do. And as the western sun began to sink into the sea, they looked around and they found themselves in a very remote part of Midgard. They had not seen a farmhouse for quite a while, but in the distance they saw one with a little smoke coming out of the chimney, and so they made their way there to try to spend the night. 
When they pulled into the farmyard, the farmer and his wife and their teenage son came out and greeted them. The farmer and his wife and the son did not recognize them as gods, but simply as travelers. And they welcomed them in and said they were, of course, welcome to spend the night and share their meal with them. And the farm wife puts two loaves of bread and some cheese on the table, and Loki and Thor looked at that and thought, well, that would make a snap. <coughs> but Thor, being gracious, said, you know, perhaps I could contribute to the meal. I could, I could bring some meat to the meal. Good wife, if you would put your pot on the, on the fire, I will go and get some meat for us. He went back outside, he unhitched his two goats, led them away from the chariot, and then he took Molnir out of his belt, and he cracked each goat right between the eyes, and the goats fell down dead. Thor pulled his amber-handled knife out, slit the goats open, peeled their skin back, took the bones and the meat, and brought them in to the farmer's wife, and put them in her pot, and in no time at all, the house began to smell of the delicious meat and the bone broth that was cooking over the fire. Now, the teenage boy, Theolfi, their son, if anybody here has ever tried to fill a teenage boy, you know the kind of appetite they have. And Theolfi, as it turned out, was probably the fastest person in all the nine worlds. No one had ever beaten Theolfi. He was such a swift runner. So he used a lot more energy than normal. And he could hardly wait to sink his teeth into meat because meat was kind of a scarcity on their table. Well, the meat was ready, but before anybody was served, Thor stood up. He said, now listen carefully. Whatever you do, do not break any of the bones. And when you are finished stripping the bones of the meat, carry the bones out and place them on the goat skins outside. And then the housewife, the, the farmer's wife, dished up five dishes of meat and bones and broth, and, and they set to eating, and Thor and the farmer and his wife got into a conversation, and they were busy eating, and, and Theophilus was over there just <laughs> eating this meat. It was so good. And Loki looked around and thought, here was an opportunity for a little bit of mischief, not too bad, just a little, to sort of satisfy my need for eating mischief. And so he slid over next to the Alfie and he said, oh, isn't this going to be good? And the boy said, yes, yes. Hardly enough of it, though, is there? Said, well, I could always use a little bit more. You know, it's a shame that that good marrow inside the bone, oh, it would be so good to get some of that marrow, wouldn't it? And the Alfie said, well, but, but your friend or your traveling companion said not to break the bones. And he said, oh, I know, I know. But you know, that one little tiny one there, you could break that one and you wouldn't even notice. It would be fine, you wouldn't mind. And so the Alfie <coughs> broke the little bone and sucked the marrow out. And it was so rich and sweet and delicious. Mm -hmm. And then he put the bones on the plate as Thor had instructed, and they all carried the bones out and put them on the goat skins. And now, filled with bellies, satisfied conversation, they all went to bed and slept the sleep angels. In the morning, before the first sparrow sang, Thor was up and went out, looked at the goat skins. He began to carefully arrange the bones in the order that they would be. And then he took Molnir out of his belt again and passed it over both of the goats and gave them a blessing. And within moments, the bones, you could hear them clicking together, the meat began to form around the ribs again. The skins wrapped themselves around the goats, and in minutes, the goats were standing alive and as healthy as they had been the day before, or so it seemed, until Thor began to lead them over to the chariot to hitch them up again, and he saw that Tooth Nasher was limping. <laughs> when he looked down, and sure enough, there was broken bone, a tiny little bone there in the left lower leg. Thor was furious. He pulled Molnir out of his belt. He stormed into the farmhouse in a voice that shook the walls and the rafters of the, of the house they slept in. Who disobeyed me? Well, the farmer and his wife fell out of bed, and Theophie jumped out of the loft where he slept. What, what, what has happened? What has happened? Someone broke a bone in my goat's foot. Who did it? The farmer was panicked. He said, please. Take our house, take our land, take it in, but please spare our lives. For now he saw who stood there in his house. 
as the Alfi. He was an honorable boy. He came down and he stepped between his father and Thor and said, please, my parents are innocent. They had nothing to do with this. I broke the bone and I sucked the marrow. <clears throat> Why would you do that, said Thor. Well, he said, your traveling companion said it would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thor looked over at Loki and went, I see. You seem to have gotten some bad advice. I will overlook it this time. Here's what's going to happen, though. You, young man, are coming with us, Jungenheim. And my ghosts will stay with your father, who can tend them and heal them while we were gone. And so, the two gods and the young boy turn their face north to Jungenheim and continue their journey on. <laughs> and Thialfi, they traveled throughout the day, throughout the day, and towards evening they came to a little girdle of water <coughs> that separated the land of men from the land of the giants. Thor looked at the sky, which was leaden. He looked at the sea in front of him. The waves were choppy. It was rough. And he said, we will stay here tonight. We will continue in the morning. And they sat down on the sand, and each one took out their knapsack and began devouring the food they'd been carrying with them during the day. Each was so hungry, and they slept there on the sand next to the water. In the morning, they rose and started walking along the water's edge, and soon they came to a boat that had been pulled up onto the shore and left. Oh, thank you. Thank you. She caught me. I was jumping ahead, so I did so we're going to still continue on. And they continued walking, and they came to a forest. To a forest. And they went through this forest, and it got thicker and thicker. Soon they were having to pick their way through, except for Thialfi. He was so fast, so fleet of foot, that even in a thick forest he could find his way through. And he was. He was darting ahead, scouting, looking for food, looking for shelter. He found no food. But towards evening he came back to Thor and to Loki. And he said, I have found a shelter, but it is unlike any shelter I have ever found. Thor was interested. They followed him into a clearing, and there was a shelter, as Thialfi had said, unlike anything the three of them had ever seen. Thor and Loki walked all the way around it and were amazed, for although it was a shelter, its opening was as wide as it was tall, and it was vast, but it had no door. It was just wide open. And they realized that any of the great halls of Asgard could have been fit right inside it. It was so vast. They went in, looked about, and Loki was saying, well, this would do in a storm. It will keep the moisture off of us. And if an animal comes looking, it will protect us. We'll be inside. And so the three of them went in, laid down, and went to sleep. And they slept well for a little while. But then, all of a sudden, the walls of this hall started to shake. And it started to shake more and more. And as it did, they started hearing this roaring, unusual noise. And the walls started shaking even harder when they did. Thor jumped up. He said, it's an earthquake. And the Alfi and Loki joined him, but they didn't know whether to run out or stay in, because although the walls were shaking, there was this roaring noise, and they did not know what was causing that. What kind of an animal would cause this loud roar, they did not know. They decided they would go out, but before they could even take a step, the shaking of the walls stopped. The roaring ceased. And all was as still as before any of it had started. Loki spoke up. He said, always, the known danger is better than the unknown danger. Let's stay inside. For they knew not what was outside. And Thor said, let's explore this hall. And they went and found that it was not only the huge area they were in, but as they went further back in it, there were five antechambers off of it. And each one they started to follow down was so long, they came back to the center one. 
And off to the side, there was one large antechamber. He said, let's sleep here. And Thialfi and Loki lay down and went to sleep. Thor crouched at the door, not the door, the entrance, and watched. And he stayed awake all night. And during the night, he would see the walls start fluttering again, never as much as that first time. And he would hear this strange animal-like noise outside. That each time he'd get ready to go inspect it and see what it was, it would stop. But at first light, Thor took his belt, which if he tightened it, it increased his strength two times. He tightened his belt. He put his hand on Mjolnir, his hammer, and he went out into the sunlight to see what it was that was causing this noise and causing this hall to shake. When he walked out, the first thing he saw, to his amazement, was that a mountain range had grown right in the clearing, where there had been none the night before. When he looked more closely, he realized it was not a mountain range. It was a giant laying there sleeping. And he watched as the giant would breathe out, <coughs> the hall's walls would begin to shudder. <laughs> and when the giant snored, it was the horrible sound they'd been listening to all night long, not knowing what kind of an animal it could be. Well, for Thor, one giant in the world was one too many. <laughs> he put his hand on his hammer and he thought, this one I'll dispatch. And as soon as he even took one step, the giant's eyes popped open. He looked at Thor, he sat up, and he was big. Thor had never seen any being this large. And he decided that Mjolnir could stay on his belt right where it was. <laughs> and politely, he asked the giant, what, is, what was his name? And the giant looked at him and said, my name is Screamer the Vast. And I don't have to ask who you are. For little man, I see that little hammer you're carrying. You must be Thor the Thunderer. But I must admit I'm surprised. I thought you'd be much bigger. <laughs> the Alfie and Loki had come out, also enjoying them. And with their there, Screamer the Vast looked at them, and he had to lean over to see them, because if he just stood, his knees would block his view of them. And he leaned over and saw me, and says, now little men, what have you done with my glove? And they looked at each other, they did not know what he was talking about. And then Screamer the Bass said, oh, there it is. And he reached over the gods and picked up the hall they had slept in the night. <laughs> and they realized they had spent the night in the thumb of the giant's glove. <laughs> and little men asked the giant, where are you headed? And Thor looked at him. He said, we are going to Utgard in Jontenheim. Oh, said the screamer, to that place. <coughs> well, I will go with you part of the way. Just part of the way. <coughs> would you happen to have any breakfast, said Loki, always hungry. <laughs> screamer said, yes, indeed. And so he opened his provision bag and served them all a lovely breakfast. And when they were finished, the giant said, you know, we're going to be traveling together, and you're going to have a hard enough time keeping up with me. Why don't we put all of your packs into mine, and I should carry it all for you. <laughs> and so Loki and Thor gave them his pack, and he put it into his, and put it on, and started off into the forest again. The Alfie kept up with him without much trouble. Thor and Loki, by noon, were running along as hard as they could. Their tongues were hanging out, and the only way they knew where Screamer was was the distant sound of the trees crashing as Screamer made his way through the forest. Finally, at the end of the day, they came into another clearing, surrounded by several great oak trees. The Alfie was sitting there under one, and Screamer was sitting under another one. Screamer said, well, finally you got here. He said, I had a long trek today. I am tired. I just want to go to sleep. So here's my pack. Open it up. Help yourself to whatever is in there. He lay down, closed his eyes, and within minutes began to snore again. 
under this great oak tree. Each time he inhaled, the leaves would flutter towards him and <laughs> they would flutter out, and the birds all took off to find a quieter place to reach for the night. Well, Loki was so hungry, he began to get a fire together. The off, he went out and got some firewood, and they got busy putting a fire together. Well, Thor tried to open the pack and tried to open the pack. He could not find where the band began or, began or ended. He could not figure out where the top was or bottom. It was, he, he worked at it, he pulled at things, but there seemed to be no way into the bag. Finally, Loki, getting hungry and hungry, came over and he tried his hand and the Alfie also, and there was no way to open the backpack of the giant. Well, Thor understood that Screamer knew exactly what he was doing, and he got furious. He looked over the snoring giant, and that's it, that's it. He tightened his belt again. He walked up to the head of Screamer. He picked up Molnir, and he took as big and hard a, a slammed it down into the giant's head. He felt, he felt the head of the hammer sink into the flesh of Screamer. Screamer sat up immediately. Oh, I did a leaf fall on my head. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at Thor and said, oh, Thor, how was dinner? Did you all enjoy it? Well, you're going to have a long day to, to tomorrow, so you might want to get some sleep. And he laid down and within minutes was snoring again. Well, Thor was stunned because never had Mjolnir not met its mark and did the damage that was necessary. This was the first time Mjolnir had failed. And he didn't know what to think. He went over to the other tree and joined Loki and Thialfi, and they all were very disturbed at this turn of events. Well, between the hunger and their concern about Mjolnir's failure, they didn't get much sleep. They lay there on the ground listening to the giant snoring and snoring. And the hours passed, and finally Thor was furious. He had enough. He tightened his belt again. He walked back over. He picked up Molnir, and again he brought it down as hard as he could on the head of the giant. This time the giant sat up. On, oh, I, I think an acorn fell on my head. <laughs> Thor, are you still up? <laughs> oh, said Thor. Well, I, I, I just woke up too. Yeah, I, I think an acorn woke me too. Yeah. And, Walked back over to where the Loki and, and the Alfie sat. He sat there listening to the giant snoring the rest of the night. Finally, just as the beast was beginning to get light, Thor could not stand it one minute longer. He picked up Molnir again. He tightened his belt as tight as he could get it. He went over and he picked up Molnir and as hard as he could, he brought it down on the giant's head. He felt the hammer head go all the way into the brains of the giant. And this time, Screamer sat up and went, you know, I think one of those birds just shot on my head. <laughs> oh, Thor, you're awake. Well, that's good because you have a long day ahead of you. Tell your companions to get ready. Now listen, I just want to tell you something. I have heard you talking among yourself and saying that I am no Thor. <coughs> and it's true, I am a giant. But when you get, when you get to act, <laughs> a guard. <laughs> You're going to find giants much larger than myself. And I want to also give you a bit of advice. They do not like bragging and braggadocia. They do not like that, so keep your mouth shut. And actually, if you want my best advice, it is that you turn around and go back to Asgard now. But if you insist on going on to Utgard, go to the east towards those mountains. And with that, he picked up his pack and saying not another word, walked off into the forest. <laughs> Hmm. Well, let me see. Good riddance to him. Let's hope we don't run into him again. <laughs> And there, when Thor saw the conditions, he said, we won't cross now. We will go in the morning. And they ate their food, they rested. And in the morning, they traveled and along the shore until they found a boat that had been pulled up on the shore and abandoned. But it was seaworthy. It was a rowboat, and they put it into the water. All of them got in it with Thor on the oars, of course. 
And each time he would pull on the oars with his massive arms, the bow of that rowboat would come out and the boat would scoop forward. They went across that body of water so quickly that by around noon, they had reached the land of the giants. And there they beached the boat and they proceeded into a large forest. A large forest. They continued journey through most of the day and they came to a place where they were seeing a huge fortress way in the distance. But even as far back as they were when they first saw it after coming out of the forest, the walls were so tall they had to lean back and look up <coughs> to see the top of it. They continued on their journey until they came right up to the walls and they found that they were sealed all the way around except for one large iron gate. Thor. This is where my strength comes in, Loki. And he went to the gates and he put one hand on each, each side of the gate and he started to pull and to try to wrench the gates apart. And he could not even move them and he was becoming so frustrated, he was moving and pulling it. And suddenly he heard Thor and he looked up and there was Loki and Thialfi standing inside. <laughs> so Loki looked and he said, Thor, remember, brains over brawn every time. <laughs> This gate is made for giants. We just walked through. <laughs> Try it, you can squeeze. And Thor was a much bigger bodied man. He did get through, he had to squeeze, but soon he also was inside of the fortress of Utgard. And they walked about and they saw giants everywhere, but none of them, none of them were as big as Scream of the Vast had warned them. What they saw that caught their eye even more though was the dullness, the plain, plainness of the building. None of the beauty of, Utgard, of, of Asgard was here in Utgard. They looked. Oh, Thor could remember the incredible blue dome in Asgard. How beautiful all the buildings were. They were a long way from that. They continued walking through Utgard, and they came to a palace. Vast in size, the door opened. And so they walked in. And when they walked into that palace, there they saw the giants, the screamer the vast had been warning them about. These were beings of such size that again, Thor thought, I've never seen anything so large. Men and women sitting on benches all around the sides of the palace hall, and at the end of it, one giant sitting all by himself. And they took it that that would be Lutgard Loki, the king. And Thor looked at him and he thought, he looks familiar. But then every giant looked the same to Thor. So they ignored that. The three of them made their way up before the throne of Utgard Loki. And they bowed before him. They greeted him warmly and politely. And Utgard Loki, he looked at them and he leaned forward so he could again see past his knees because they were so small. He said, I know who you are. You with the hammer. You're the little man that they call Thor the Thunderer. I am surprised because I would have thought you would be much, much bigger. <laughs> but that's such a small hammer. <laughs> Thor, I will tell you this. You and your companions are welcome here. If you have the mastery of a skill, a feat of strength, a challenge for us. For none are invited or allowed to stay in Utgard <coughs> that do not have some form of entertainment for us. Thor, what is it that you are good at? What skills do you have? And what skills do your companions have? Loki could see that Thor had nothing on the top of his mind at the moment, and so he stepped up and said, I will challenge anyone here to an eating contest. <laughs> Loki had not eaten for a day and a half, and he was really hungry. And he was quite famous for his appetite. An eating contest, excellent, said Utgard Loki. He called for a great trencher to be brought in that was almost as long as the hall itself. And he called for all the cooks of the palace to fill it with great hunks of meat, shoulders of reindeer, and loins of boar, and all kinds of game that they ate in that area. 
and the cooks brought it in and they filled the trencher with meat and gravy. And then Utgard Loki called one of the smaller giants over, said, Loki, Loki, this is Loki, he will be eating against you. There was a chair at each end of the trencher. Loki went to one and Loki went to the other. And when Utgard Loki brought his hand down, they began to eat. Well, Loki grabbed this great haunch of ox and sunk his little pointy teeth into it and began to rip the meat off of it and tear it with his hands and stuff it into his mouth. And he got so carried into it, in a way, he, he climbed out of the chair and onto the trencher and, and he began to just continue to eat and rip the meat off. And when he'd get to the bone with just a little meat left on it, he would pull it between his teeth until it was clean as a whistle and toss it over his shoulder and mm -hmm. scooped up the gravy. The gravy ran down his chin, it was on his hands, he was slurping it up and eating the meat and moving along the trencher. He was eating it so fast he knew that he was going to win. And finally, when he and Logie met nose to nose in the middle of this trencher, he sat back pretty confident that he had won. <laughs> but it wasn't even close. But God Logie said, well, it was a good try, Loki. But Loki wins. What are you talking about, said Loki. Look, there's nothing left but bones in my trencher. Well, that's true. But if you look over here, Loki, Loki has eaten the meat. And he's eaten the bones. And he's eaten the trencher. <laughs> so I'm afraid that the gods lose this round. Okay. Uh, better next. Better luck on the next fight. <laughs> and so, Utgard Loki asked, well, who is next? And Thialfi the Swift stepped forward. And he said, I am. I will outrun anyone you choose in this hall to race against me. I can outrun any of the gore riffraff in this hall. He had clearly been spending too much time with Loki. <laughs> <laughs> well, Utgard Loki smiled. And he said, who do you? a page boy in his court, said, come, race against the Alfie. And all of the court got up and left the hall, and they went out onto a great plain where the race could be run. Utgard Loki looked at the Alfie and said, this is where we'll run. You'll start here. You will run all the way down the field to that post, go around it, and come back and finish right here. The Alfie was ready. He said, finally, I will get to show what I can do, and I will show these giants. They aren't so clever. He took and put his foot on the line next to Hoogie. Utgard Loki raised his hand and lowered it to start the race, and the two runners took off together. They were racing shoulder by shoulder down and around the post and coming back. It looked like it would be a dead heat, except before they got to the end, suddenly Hoogie pulled away and just sprinted to the end so that when Thialfi came, Hoogie was standing there waiting. The Alfie had never been beaten by anyone, and he was unnerved, but he looked at Utgard Loki and said, I would like to race again. <laughs> Utgard Loki smiled. He liked that. He said, but the Alfie, don't you think you'll need to try a little harder if you want to outrun him again? The Alfie was fuming. He put his foot to the line, as did Hugi. Again, Utgard Loki's head went up, and he started the race, and down they went. But somehow, Thialfi could not believe what he was seeing. Because when he got to the post and thought he was tied with Hoogie, he went around the post, and Hoogie was standing at the finish line. Thialfi did not even understand how this could have happened. But he made his way back to the start, and he looked at Ulkar Loki. He says, one more try. One more try. I'm going to give it everything I can. And Ulkar Loki said that would be good. He would need to. <laughs> and he raised his hand for the start of the third race, and we lowered it. The Alfie was so ready. Oh, he was there, and his foot came up, and he was ready to go as fast, faster than he had ever gone. But when his foot came up, Hoogie was finishing. <laughs> the Alfie had not even made one step. Well, the races had been decided fairly and decidedly. Hoogie had won, not the Alfie. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, you keep putting back your putting your weakling companions up here, but when are you going to engage in a contest yourself, Thor? What would you do? Thor said, I would challenge you to a drinking contest. <laughs> Excellent, said the guard Loki. Now I must tell you that my horn, my drinking <coughs> horn, is quite large. But the tallest, biggest giants in the hall can finish it in one draft. The middle-sized giants, they may take two drafts to finish it. And the small fellows, well, they can finish it in three. Let's see what you can do, Thor. And the horn was brought in. It was not so terribly wide, but it was exceptionally long. Thor looked at it. He, he thought it was something he could finish. He had a big capacity. He picked it up, put it to his lips, and he began to drink. He opened his throat and he poured that golden ale down his throat and he drank and he drank and he drank and he drank until he was sure the horn was empty. He brought it down. It was barely an inch from the surface. Oh, poor oh. oh, said Utgard Loki. I am surprised. I, I thought you would have a bigger capacity for drinking. You're going to have to drink quite a bit more if you're going to get it down in two gulps. Thor picked it up again, he put it to his lips, he brought it up again, he drank and he drank and he drank and he drank and he drank until he had to stop to catch a breath. And he brought it down. It had gone down even less than the first time. Well, if anyone had told me that Thor of Asgard could only drink this small amount, I would not have believed them, said Arkard Loki. But if you're going to finish this in three gulps, you had better start now. It would be a shame to misrepresent the gods of Asgard by not being able to finish it in a final swallow. Thor picked up the horn and said to himself, I will finish this or I will drown in crime. He brought it to his lips again. He tipped it up and he drank and he drank. He drank until his face turned red and sweat broke out on his forehead and he had to stop and put it down. And again, it was even less out this time than the first two tries. Well, Utgard Loki would not let him shame himself further. Perhaps you're not as great as we thought you were, Thor. But perhaps there's another contest that you would do better in, because clearly drinking is not doing you justice. He said, clearly, the biggest strength we've seen so far from the gods is boasting. <laughs> he said, but Thor, I want you to win. I want you to succeed. And so I've got an idea. There is another game. Well, it's hardly a game. My children play it. It's, it's not a game I would ever have thought of suggesting to you, the great Thor. But since we've come to see that your strength is not nearly what we had heard, perhaps this game will give you a chance. It's called Lifting the Kitty. My kids play it. And the idea, Thor, is that you have to lift my kitty off the ground. Now, Kitty doesn't like to be moved. You know what cats are. <laughs> the cat walked into the room and lay down. Thor looked at it. He said, could cats be that different between Asgard and Utgard? For it was the largest cat, if indeed it was a cat, that he had ever seen. And Utgard Loki said, now the cat, the kitty gets to put all four paws into the ground to hold really tight. And then you just see if you can lift it up. And he saw the look on Thor's face. He said, well, Thor, you're not afraid of a kitty, are you? <laughs> Thor was not going to admit that, yes, he was afraid of this kitty. He walked towards the cat, and the cat turns his head and spat at him. Thor went over and reached under the belly of the cat and started to lift it up. But as he started to lift it up, the cat's back arched. And he lifted it further, and the back arched even more. And he lifted it further, and the cat's back continued just to stretch and arch. And Thor got underneath the cat, and with all his strength was pushing up, and the cat's back continued to stretch and arch. 
But at length, Thor got one paw to come loose. And when he did, one of the giants stood up and yelled, He's pulled a paw loose! As if it was something remarkable. But it was the best Thor could do. He could not, he could not get another paw loose. He let the cat go. Utgard Loki was delighted. Gleefully, he stood up and he yelled, Kitty wins! Kitty wins! <laughs> Thor was furious. He said, I want another challenge. I want another contest. Someone wrestle me! And the giants began to laugh. <laughs> Thor, you have to be reasonable. There is not a self-respecting giant in this room that is going to wrestle someone who can't get a cat off the ground. <laughs> but if you want to wrestle someone, then I would suggest you wrestle my old nursemaid, Ellie. <laughs> now about this time, an old crone came shuffling into the room. She was so ancient, too. There was just wisps of hair on her head. You could see her scalp through that, through that thinness of her gray hair. Her, her face was covered with wrinkles. She was, she was bent half over. She, she couldn't straighten up. She was wearing a, a shapeless gown and house slippers. <laughs> she was so frail, it looked as though a breeze could knock her over. Utgard Loki said, Ellie, wrestle with Thor. That woman made her way to the room. Stopped. Well, Thor wanted to make this humiliation over as quickly as he could. He began to circle this old woman. And finally, he moved in for his wrestling move. Now, I wish that this were a long story, but it isn't. <laughs> he grabbed the woman, the old woman, and he began to try to bring her down to one knee. It was as though she was rooted to the ground. It was as though she were a tree. She was immovable. And then she began to make her move. Thor did his best to stand against her, but she brought him down, and finally one of his knees touched the ground, and Utgard Loki said, the contest is over. That is it. Thor, we are not going to have any more contests with my people. But come, join me at table, and let us celebrate and you may spend the night. Now, Thor and Loki and Thialfi were amazed by Utgard Loki's generosity that night. He truly was gracious, inviting them to table, no longer making fun of them, or putting them down in any way. And in the morning, they departed Utgard. Loki, Thialfi, and Thor, accompanied by Utgard Loki, left the citadel and went out, went across a plain, and came near to the forest they would need to re-enter to journey back to Asgard. Utgard Loki pointed the way that they would need to travel. And then he looked at Thor. Thor, I have a question. Have you proven what you had hoped to prove by your journey here to the land of the gods? Thor said, no. No. I do not feel we have represented the gods well. We have not shown you how strong, how great and mighty the gods are. But Utgard Loki, I will tell you this. If you think the gods are weak, that would be your mistake. And Utgard Loki looked at Thor. And he said, Thor, now that the official visit is over, now that we are out of the citadel, let me tell you that not all is exactly as it seems. You will never, ever step foot inside of Utgard again as long as I am king. For your visit very nearly undid us. Thor looked at him, he says, explain yourself. Utgard Loki, Loki looked at him and said, as I said, not everything was as it seems. The giant that met you in the woods. Screamer the vast. That was me. That was me. He said, the provisions bag. Well, he says, also I want to tell you, when you hit me in the head with the hammer, he said, Thor, look beyond Utgard. And Thor looked past 
and there was a mountain. He said, you see those valleys, those unusual valleys? And Thor looked, and there were three very square-shaped valleys in the mountain. Utgard Loki said, those are the marks caused by your hammer. Each time you got ready to strike me, I pulled the mountain range between us so quickly you couldn't see it, and your hammer sank into the mountain, and that, those square valleys, will remain forever as a testament to your strength. <laughs> the provisions bag. I had it secured with iron banding that had no end. You could never have opened it, and I knew that. The contest. Well, the contest. Loki, Loki, you did well. You did well. But I had you competing against Loki. And Loki is wildfire. And it consumes everything in its path. And Thialfi. Thialfi, never have I seen one like you run so fast. However, your opponent was Hugi, who was thought you can never be overcome. And Thor, your three draughts the drinking horn nearly undid us. We were so concerned. Because although it is not wide, you noticed it was uncommonly long. Because the tail end of that drinking horn ended in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Thor, you drank so much. <laughs> that when you come out of the forest and you're back at the edge of the sea, look and you will see the mark at where the water was. <laughs> Before you drink, and from this day forward, twice each day, will the seas of the world fill and empty in honor, in honor of your heroic deed. <laughs> Thor, lifting the kitty is when you very nearly undid our world. For it was not to catch at all, but it was the Midgard serpent which encircles the world and holds it together. That is why one of the giants yelled when one paw came up. For had you gotten the ball up, our world would have been undone. And Ellie. Ellie that you wrestled, for Ellie is old age. And not you, Thor, nor any person, nor any god, will ever beat old age. <laughs> Now Thor of Asgard, go back to Asgard, <laughs> and do not ever return here. Thor was furious, he tightened his belt, he took Mjolnir out of his belt and decided he would strike Utgard Loki down right there. And he swung his hammer and when it came down, no one was there, Utgard Loki had disappeared. Thor took Mjolnir and turned because he decided he would take down the very walls of, of Utgard. But when he turned to do that, Utgard itself was gone. There was just a plane leading to the mountain range of the three square valleys. <laughs> How many times have I told you? Brains over brawn every time, said Loki. Cunning always beats might. Would you like to say that to my hammer. <laughs> and so the three turned their faces back and began to return to Asgard and their homes.